welcome to Onyx Pages. My name is Njeri and thank you for watching this video. Welcome, first of all, to anybody who has subscribed and for whom this is uh, your first video. I hope that you enjoy what you see. I am very interactive, so please feel free to leave a message in the comments. Uh, please like this video if you like it. And uh, let's just get started. This is going to be a seven calorie shell review of Kindred by Octavia Butler. Uh, but this is the graphic version, the graphic edition of uh, Kindred. And this is an adaptation by Damien Duffy and John Jennings. So I read this in December and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it, but I also will be making very slight references to the original Kindred story in its novel form, which writ was written by Octavia E. Butler and had no pretty pictures. So Overall, um, just to give you a sense of the synopsis of the story, in this, uh, in this speculative fiction, uh, magical realism, Afrofuturism uh, novel, we follow a woman named Dana. Dana's in her late 20s, and uh, one day Dana realizes that she has gone back into time, into uh, to Maryland during the slave era where she realizes that she is on the plantation of one of her white ancestors. And she can't control this time travel thing that's happening to her, but throughout the novel, she does get an understanding of why it's happening, what her role is in all of it, and she has to make decisions about that role. Okay, so we had some technical difficulties, they are dealt with. I told you a little bit about the, the plot, uh, if, and I'm just going to move on. I'm going to assume that I finished what I needed to say um, about the plot, um, but I do want to make uh, a couple of points about the story of Kindred. One of the reasons why I found it really interesting um, was the fact that it it was written from the, from the perspective of a black woman in her late 20s. and this story takes us through her trying to figure out and developing a strategy to deal with what's happening to her. And the point that I was trying to make about uh, the Brown sisters in their podcast, How to Survive the End of the World, is what they were saying is that in past stories where we've got the time travelers trope, we have somebody who uh, is caught in another time period, um, you know, but somebody who has made the decision that they want to time travel in some way. In this case, we've got someone uh, up onto whom time travel is being imposed. She doesn't ask for the ability to time travel. She doesn't understand how she is being thrown back into time. She's not, while she's understanding how long she's away and the fact that time moves at different speeds when she's back in time versus when she's in the present day, she does, she still doesn't understand what started this in the first place and when it will actually end. Um, so I thought that was really that was really interesting. The first time I read, I read Kindred, I was just in it for the story and I, I thought it an amazing and difficult and brutal story. Uh, this time, certainly with the graphic novel, I have been given all of these images and I noticed that in reading the graphic novel, I find myself thinking about the story through the eyes of more than one character. So I'm not only thinking about Dana, I'm thinking about her husband, I'm thinking about her a uh, white male ancestor who grows up on a plantation and then ends up being in charge of the plantation himself. Uh, and I think about the community of enslaved Africans who live on that plantation and the life that they create for themselves, the community that they create. Um, what, what I found really difficult about the graphic novel was that I felt forced to deal with and reckon with all of the characters. I found that when I was reading the book as a novel without any images, I was very much focused on Dana and not so much everyone else. All of the other characters were peripheral to me. But I feel that with the introduction of images into the graphic novel, I was forced to 
entertain a cast of protagonists that I really frankly did not want to empathize with. So it was a difficult read for me uh, in that respect, in addition to the fact that the art, while the art definitely took me to where I, I guess I needed to go, it wasn't as beautiful as I would have liked. I like round, s soft, intense color. Um, and the art was scratchy and gritty. And I, I guess that is part of the process, right? Like you wanna create art that will get the reader to, f to feel what the atmosphere was actually like. And the art, I found the art uncomfortable, unfinished, sketchy. Um, it was definitely well done, but it left me feeling like unsafe as a reader, like it was harsh and scratchy. And I guess that's what Dana experienced when she was taken back and in a really violent way to this to this time period of, um, of uh, slavery in the past. So I'm still thinking about how I feel about this graphic novel, but I just I don't want this video to be too long. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, do the seven cowrie shell um, review. So the first Carrie Shell asks us to consider plot. What did I think about the plot? And I would give a full Carrie Shell for plot. Um, the reason I would give a full Carrie Shell is because Octavia Butler is amazing. This story uh, takes us through two main plot lines. So we're taken through um, the the current day Dana and her husband dealing with you know being working class and what that looks like. They met as uh, two members of an employment agency. Um, and then they also take us through this, uh, you know, the 1870s in Maryland and uh, what it meant to be an African person uh, on US soil at that time. Uh, it, was a, it was a really well thought out plot. I probably need to read it several other times and I'm sure that each time I read it, I'm gonna learn more. Um, sh the story was compact, it was contained uh, all of my questions were answered, nothing was left unsaid. So it was really well done. Um, the second is, the second cowrie is about uh, characters. I really enjoyed the characters. Uh, I didn't like them. I, I really didn't like most of the characters. And I think the fact that I have strong feelings about them is a testament to the character development. If you asked me what her ancestor Rufus what his motivations were or what the motivations were of um, the person who we find out is her great grandmother or what Dana's motivations or her husband's motivations were, I would be able to explain them to you. And the reason I, I could explain them to you um, is because Octavia did a really great job of letting us into the minds of the um, of the characters and John Jennings and Damien Duffy did an excellent job of um, creating visual images that could get us to get me to actually understand and in some cases empathize with the emotions that were felt by the characters at the time. The violence was even more violent in, in graphic form. The love was even more loving. The fear and the anxiety was that much more prominent because I had these, vis these visuals that um, had a, a visual narrative that was going on while the text-based narrative was going on as well, which made it a really lovely experience, but a difficult one. Um, the world building. So there are there's one world at two different times. And um, while this wasn't a hugely crafted world, because this is in some ways a work of historical fiction, um, I, I think that Octavia Butler did an exceptional job of, um, you know, portraying this, this plantation and these times in a way that felt very full. Sometimes when I'm reading a story, there might be, I, I feel like I'm just getting one snippet of this society. And I, and I think that I got a good sense of what was going on around this plantation, even though the, the scenes really only take place in the house, in the fields, and in the forest. And there's no other location that we see. And then the scenes from present day, uh, Dana's life, uh, I think are for the most part the inside of her apartment, um, and maybe there's one or two scenes where she's she's somewhere else, but it's all very, very contained. And the two time periods mirror each other. And so um, 
I would say that the world building was was excellent uh, within the context of it being having more historical uh, fiction uh, aspects rather than let's say fantasy. So a full cowrie shell for uh, the world building. Um, was th there any LGBT content? Now, to my recollection, I would say that there wasn't. Um, uh, however, there was a question about what femininity looked like. So Dana, would, when she went back in time, Dana's not a skirt wearing, dress wearing woman. She has a short cropped afro. She wears uh, shirts and pants. And every time she would go back, she'd be asked, uh, you know, are, are you a man? Are you a woman? Why don't you dress like a woman? Don't you want a skirt or a dress? Like, what are you trying to prove here? And she would just say, this is how I dress. And this is how, you know, in my, in my time period, women have the choice to dress in these ways. And so, um, you know, I, I like the fact that she, was comfortable in you know in the expression of her her own gender but I wouldn't say that the story went so far as to take on any sort of LGBT questions or issues in in any real way um, so I think I, I am probably going to give zero carry shells for for that um, is this Afrofuturist yes we have a black woman who is um, she has I wouldn't say the gift of time travel, but she has the burden of time travel and the idea that a woman can move back in time and influence the past uh, for a reason that you'll find out if you read it uh, and then influence the, the future and impact the way that she lives her life, the way that she views her relationships, the way that she views herself. That is an Afrofuturist theme. So a full cowrie shell for Afrofuturism. Uh, is this aspirational? I would give a full cowrie shell for aspirational. Um, Dana is forced to into a quest that she didn't choose. Uh, but once she realizes what this quest is, she decides to commit to it. And I appreciate that and I respect that because I think, certainly as a black woman, I make decisions uh, and I participate in things that are difficult to participate in from my own social location. So um, it, it definitely is aspirational. And Dana participates in this time travel that requires her to help a group of people that she probably wouldn't otherwise help. Um, by, by doing that, there's there's a hope that she starts to generate and starts to speak about. Uh, and I, I appreciated that. Um, were there any challenges of societal norms? I would say, um, well, for aspirational, one, Carrie Shell. Uh, and are there any societal norms that are challenged here? <clears throat> I would give, I would give half a cowrie shell here, and the only reason why I wouldn't give a full cowrie shell is that I think that there were some missed opportunities to explore um, even more breaches on societal norms. I'll say that there are two aspects of uh, societal norms that I think are challenged. Number one, as a black female protagonist and her role in her heterosexual relationship with her husband, Dana. Uh, is a self-possessed woman and she is strong. Um, she uh, stands by her word and she's also willing to be and able to be vulnerable. Like she's got a huge heart and a lot of courage. Um, and that's not a challenge necessarily to uh, societal norms, but I think that Octavia Butler uh, and through the art um, and the graphic adaptation, we see Dana as so many things, right? Able to be a nurturer and able to be a protector, um, but also able to be a warrior and um, to engage in acts of violence in order to achieve a greater good. And, and I think that that's, that's an, amazing, uh, an amazing thing. Uh, but there were some some opportunities for additional challenging that that didn't happen, and um, it is what it is. Uh, and then I think the last cowrie shell is um, I think I did all of them. Yeah, I did plot, character, world building, LGBT content, aspirational. 
Is it Afrofuturist as a challenge norms? Yes, I've done all seven. I have absolutely no idea what the final count is, but I will put it up either here or there. Uh, but I definitely did appreciate Kindred. It's a great, very, very great novel. Um, and I would recommend that you read it. Uh, I would also suggest that you read both uh, the novel and uh, the graphic adaptation because I think that they they tell the same story, but they tell the story in different ways. I do want to uh, point you to one page in here before I end this video. And actually, no, no, that's not, not a good example. I will point you to page 19. So, this is an example of what some of the art looks like. And if you look closely at this child's face, right? The fear and, yeah, mostly fear and shock. When I read this book, I really didn't appreciate how innocent this child was. <clears throat> but when I had to encounter his face over and over and over again in the graphic novel, I found myself challenged to be like, okay, I know that you're just a little boy here, but you're going to grow, you are the son of a plantation owner and you buy and sell African bodies. So I have no desire to have feelings of empathy for you. That's e that was easier to do when reading the novel than when actually seeing the images. And I found that really difficult. So that was just an example of some of the images. Okay, so I hope that you enjoyed uh, this video. If you have read Kindred, I know that, um, I think it's Bookish Charm, I hope I got your uh, channel right, uh, but there is a booktuber who has read who read both the graphic novel and the um, text-based novel back to back. I'd be really interested in seeing uh, your thoughts. Uh, but I will see you in the comments section below. Thanks very much for watching Onyx Pages, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.